with that, let's talk about the arms embargo and let me introduce a great friend of mine and in my mind, the most knowledgeable man uh, who has worked behind the scenes on Iran uh, in the most patriotic of ways, uh, Norman Rule, who was the intelligence manager on Iran for uh, far longer than I want to say on a public forum because it will age him. Uh, but he knows Iran, um, loves Iran in many ways because of the culture and the people uh, and can speak fluently on it and is an expert really on the weapons transfers that are is at issue today. So with that, I get to introduce my friend, Norman Rule. Norman, I turn it over to you virtually and I hope to see you soon in person. Good morning. Thank you, Mark, for that very generous uh, opening. I'd like to provide a few comments and uh, to show a, a very few a number of slides to uh, to assist the uh, viewers. May I, I have the first slide, please? Um, next slide, please. So Iran has repeatedly stated its intent to modernize its military system, especially in the areas of air power, missiles, air defense, and naval capabilities. Events have also pushed Iran to uh, move in this direction. Its military deficiencies compelled it to rely upon the Russian military during the Syrian conflict. Likewise, Iran has expressed an interest in expanding its ability to project power in the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Red Sea, primarily because of its involvement in the Yemen conflict. Both of these conflicts have provided Iran with experiences that showed that its Revolutionary Guard and its regular military could better project power and support proxies if they only had more advanced weapons. In defiance of multiple UN resolutions, Iran has also provided its proxies with missiles and a variety of weapon systems. This, this campaign of weapons provision has not only increased the ferocity of the conflicts in the region, but has ex exacerbated their impact on innocent civilians from Yemen to Syria. But it's also compelled Israel to conduct hundreds of airstrikes to delay system delivery that would risk a, a conventional conflict in the region. Similarly, these systems have been used by the Yemeni, Yemen's Houthis to conduct attacks on Saudi Arabia that have not only exacerbated that conflict and threatened the kingdom, but it has threatened the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of foreign nationals who live in the kingdom. Next slide, please. So what would happen if Iran were to gain access to, to additional military? Well, I think we need to look a little bit um, outside of, of the, the area. Iran has uh, the arms embargo currently prevents Iran from undertaking a lot of activities uh, in the region for its weaponry, but China and Russia have historically and repeatedly stated that they would be willing to provide Iran with weapons, and they have done so in the past. Moscow and Beijing both look upon Iran as a, a way of limiting U.S. power in the region and Western influence in the, in the region. Iran would represent a very attractive arms market uh, to the uh, Chinese and uh, Russian uh, weapons manufacturers. Let me give you just a few very brief examples of what Iran might require. Since 2016, Iran has publicly stated an interest in acquiring Russia's Sukhoi-30 fighters, which have been used extensively in Syria. And in essence, Iran seeks to acquire an air force to allow it to do in countries what it has done with Russia in Syria. Similarly, Iran bought J-7 uh, fighter aircraft from China in the past and is seeking to modernize these to a new system, the J-10 or J-10C fighters. And this is an aircraft that would give it a performance capacity that's roughly equal to that of, say, an F-16 fighting Falcon. Iran also operates Russian-built Kilo-class submarines, but it's not only looking to update these submarines, but may purchase um, uh, Chinese Yuan diesel uh, 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 submarines, which are much quieter, or cruise missiles or missile capacity to allow it to undertake missile operations, again, in the Arabian Sea or uh, water areas. This system in general would allow Iran to increase its power and to increase the type of systems it provides to its neighbors. I'd like to speak about its neighbors now. Next slide, please. 
So Iran's neighbors are currently going through a series of unprecedented financial pressures, and they're all seeking to reduce their military budgets. Iran's acquisition of new weapons will make it very difficult for these countries to reduce their budgets, and they'll actually have to look at acquiring new deterrents, deterrents and defense programs, particularly in the areas of air defense uh, and offensive missile capabilities to have that deterrent, counter uh, submarine activities, and other very expensive systems. The, I should also note and close with this uh, comment that we're, we've seen Iran use its missiles not only directly against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and provide missile uh, capacity to Lebanese Hezbollah and to the Houthis, but as this missile uh, uh, production and its use increases throughout the region, we're facing the growing prospect of a missile race in the region, which would be hugely expensive and would divert resources from badly needed social programs and would significantly destabilize the region uh, to develop a missile race. Russia has responded, as well as China, that they're willing to sell weapons to Gulf states and to other states. So in essence, you have Russia and China being willing to provide the weapons that would, that would foster this military race throughout the region. At a time when the region's stability is on the verge of so many important social and political changes, the last thing we need is a, an arms race that would uh, upset this process. Thank you.